All right, I think we're ready to get started. Hello and welcome to Palestine for Hawaii. I'm Dr. Sada Hamoud, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the College of the Holy Cross. And on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our friends at Jadalia for hosting our webinar and to a couple of folks who you won't hear from, but who have been instrumental in bringing us together behind the scenes, uh, Professor Noura Arakat of Rutgers University and Dr. Ali Musleh of Columbia University. In the wake of- uh, Sarah? Yes, please. We just went live. So oh, you okay. might want to do a very quick recap. I mean, we went live okay. halfway through just to make sure that you, uh, we are catching everyone who just joined live. Of course, of course, okay. Thank you, Bassam. All right, let me just start from the top. Uh, hello and welcome to Palestine for Hawaii. For everybody that's just joining us, I'm Dr. Sadat Hamoud, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the College of the Holy Cross. And on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our friends at Jadalia for hosting our webinar and to a couple of folks who you won't hear from, but who have been instrumental in bringing us together behind the scenes, Professor Noura Arakat of Rutgers University and Dr. Ali Musleh of Columbia University. In the wake of the recent wildfires in Maui, our teach-in today centers the histories and experiences of Kanaka Maoli communities with US settler colonialism in Hawaii, continued organizing for Hawaiian sovereignty and practices of solidarity between Hawaii and Palestine. It is grounded in the recognition as Palestinians that Native Hawaiians ongoing struggles for freedom from US military occupation and settler colonialism are interconnected with our own continued struggle for liberation from Israeli colonial violence. I was fortunate to be invited to visit Hawaii this past year as part of a Students and Faculty for Justice in Palestine Decolonial November visit. The visit, which was largely organized by one of our wonderful colleagues here, uh, Professor Cynthia Franklin, uh, which brought me to UH Manoa and to meet with scholars, artists, activists, and movement workers in the local community, opened my eyes and my heart as a Palestinian to Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian experiences with US settler colonialism and military occupation and their ongoing struggles for sovereignty. It was a deeply moving experience for me and for my daughter, Aya, which we learned is an important word in the Hawaiian language, uh, not only because of what I learned, but also because of the warmth and joy and love with which we were welcomed. It felt like a homecoming. Friendships and community sharing our stories with each other and uplifting each other's movements are, in Cynthia Franklin's words, the things that, quote, breathe life into struggles for human being and belonging to one another, to more than humans and to water, stars, sky, aina end quote. It is this urgency for uplifting each other's collective breath and continuing to build connections across our communities that brings us here today. When I returned from Palestine just a few weeks ago and began learning about the devastation in Maui, I felt the familiar pain and grief that I felt so often watching my own community struggle to rebuild after the multiple disasters wrought by colonialism in our, in our own homeland. We in the Palestinian community decided to organize this teach-in as an expression of love and reciprocal solidarity with our Native Hawaiian family. We want you to know that we see you, we're with you, and we honor your ongoing efforts to rebuild your communities and your livelihoods, uh, just as we stand with you in your ongoing struggle for land, life, and liberation. And on that note, I'd like to remind our audience that part of the purpose of this teach-in is also to raise funds for Hawaiian-led mutual aid projects. And we're lifting up two in particular that have been doing incredible work on the ground, Maui Medic Healers Hui, a grassroots community organization that provides grounded, culturally appropriate, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual support in times of distress and repair, and Pacific Birth Collective, a community-based network that is working to meet the specific needs of pregnant moms, children, and newborns with housing, medical care, and other needs. My colleagues will be dropping the links to both organizations here in the chat, and we would all appreciate you donating as generously as you can if you are able. And it's now my honor to introduce our first speaker, a friend and colleague who has been involved in the Palestine Solidarity Movement for many years, Professor J. K. Haolani Kawanui, who will be moderating our conversation 
J.K. Halani Kawanui is Professor of American Studies and Affiliate Faculty in Anthropology at Wesleyan University, where she teaches courses related to critical indigenous studies, critical race studies, settler colonial studies, and anarchist studies. She is the author of Hawaiian Blood, Colonialism, and the Politics of Sovereignty and Indigeneity, Duke University Press 2008, Paradoxes of Hawaiian Sovereignty, Land, Sex, and the Colonial Politics of State Nationalism, 2018, and Speaking of Indigenous Politics, Conversations with Activists, Scholars, and Tribal Leaders. She serves on the advisory board for the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Thank you, Professor Kawanui. Pardon me. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah, not just for the introduction, but for organizing this teach-in and fundraiser. Aloha kako, balina kako, greetings everyone. Mahalo and shukran for tuning in today. I also want to thank uh, Noor and Ali mentioned earlier for their work on the beautiful promotional electronic flyer. I've just put the speaking order into the chat box and want to let people who are attending know that we'll go to the top of the hour and then after the program, um, we close that part of it, we will have a Q&A session for 20 more minutes. Uh, I'm going to um, introduce the speakers after I lay out some framing and I also want to just repost the link to the Jadalia page that also includes the bios in case you miss any details that you want to chase up later. It's now one month since the August 8th Maui wildfires began. Notably, just last night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the New York Times issued a breaking news alert that the number of people missing from Maui dropped from 385 to 66. This comes as great relief to those who feared that up to 3,000 people might never be accounted for but also as of last night, the confirmed death toll remains at 115 individuals, all unnecessary deaths. As Naomi Klein and Kapua Ala Sprout have documented in their answering of the question, why was there no water to fight the fire on Maui? Big corporations, golf courses, and hotels have been taking water from Kanaka Maui, that is indigenous Hawaiians, and locals for years following 19th century plantations that diverted water to the sugar and pineapple industries that hastened deforestation. And now those who have suffered immeasurably are also having to organize against new waves of water and land theft and from more than one direction. On August 19th, Hawaii Governor Josh Green signed an emergency proclamation prohibiting the making of any unsolicited offer to purchase or otherwise acquire land in the areas hit by the fires. He did so with the stated goal, quote, to protect it for our local people so it's not stolen by people on the mainland, end quote. However, while this may seem like an earnest effort to fend off predatory purchase offers that prey on those most pulverized by the devastation, we know from the ways in which the city, county, and state governments abandoned the people of Maui during their most crucial time of need both before and after the fires, I should say both before, during, and after the fires, that the stated aim of protection is a farce. It is also worth pointing out that as early as one week after fires started, the governor was already discussing state acquisition of those same lands. His vision must be understood as part of ongoing settler colonial dispossession. And perhaps surprisingly, while some news coverage has been decent in identifying the role of colonialism in relation to the climate crisis in this case, rather than presenting it simply as some natural disaster, it is also the case that it has been, that has typically been named as background history. To be clear, it is one thing to trace the history of colonialism in Maui and the Hawaiian archipelago more broadly, but that historicization should not relegate colonialism to the past especially given that it is Kanaka Maoli in particular, although not exclusively, were continuously subject to settler colonial elimination in the present. Reckoning with that reality necessitates understanding the role of both tourism and gentrification, 
guarded by an imperialist US military presence as settler colonial projects that depend on the illegal expropriation of land and water. I say illegal because Hawaii is a case of an illegal occupation that followed three distinct, that was followed by three distinct yet related developments, right? So you first have that unlawful US backed settler overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom in 1893. And I say US backed settler overthrow because you had a group of local settlers most from the US, but not exclusively, white men. They were all white men. They were mostly US citizens, backed by the US Marines. And one of those included the US um, foreign minister. Then you have, you know, you have after that a change in presidential administration. I can't rehearse the whole entire scene between that 1893 and annexation of 1898, but suffice to say that in the midst of it, you have the settlers forming their own government by 1894 called the Republic of Hawaii and they make a bid for the US to annex the islands. And so you have the unilateral annexation by the US federal government in violation of international law operating at the time of the archipelago, the entire Kapai Aina o Hawaii as a US colonial territory. And then after that, you've got the attempted for decades leading up to 1959, the attempted absorption of the Hawaiian nation into the 50th state of the so-called union. I lay all this out not only um, in a cursory way, but not only to offer broader political context, but because I also want to highlight the structural comparisons with Palestine, which, as Sarah mentioned earlier, are grounded in the overarching mode of domination at work in both sites, settler colonization. Notice I didn't say settler colonialism, I said settler colonization. This is not to erase or deny the reality of occupation and illegal apartheid in Palestine, but to understand both as part of a settler colonial project as they work in the service of Israeli land expropriation and hence the expulsion of Palestinians, right? So just in two examples, Netanyahu has been very explicit for a very long time about his aims to annex the West Bank, where we see the state of Israel backed and bankrolled by the US flooding that territory with settlers. It is also worth noting that Palestinians are no strangers to water crises. Just last week, Al Jazeera reported yet again on regional droughts intensifying, temperatures rising, and Israel's far-right government entrenching military rule over the occupied territory, worsening Palestinian access to water for everything from bodily consumption to farming, as the demands of Israeli settler outposts are violently prioritized. It is the prioritization of settler society, of settler futures that must be tackled and brought down, and as the people of Maui rebuild. And while Kanaka Maui on island have made it clear time and again, they care about the survival and endurance of everyone who is hit by this horrific devastation. They also insist that all recovery efforts be guided by Hawaiian principles grounded in ethics of mutual care which always already includes protection of our ancestral lands and waters. I'm gonna pop in the chat box, um, a link to that article I, I um, mentioned from Al Jazeera. Now to introduce our speakers. Our first presenter will be Dr. Cynthia Franklin. She is professor of English at the University of Hawaii and co-edits the journal Biography. She is the author of a brand new book, titled Narrating Humanity, Life Writing and Movement Politics from Palestine to Mauna Kea that just came out earlier this year. Her other books include one titled Academic Lives, Memoir, Cultural Theory and the University Today, published in 2009, and the other titled Writing Women's Communities, The Politics and Poetics of Multi-Genre Anthologies from 1994. She has co-edited special journal issues, which include for biography, one that is totally open access titled Life in Occupied Palestine from 2014. Additionally, she has served for 10 years on the organizing collective of the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, US AFI, and co-founded students, students and Faculty for Justice in Palestine at the University of Hawaii. That's SFJP at UH as well as Jewish Voice for Peace, Hawaii. Next, we will hear from Kahala Johnson, who is a doctoral candidate in indigenous politics, futures, 
and Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Their research focuses on genderqueer and poly decolonial love and their dissertation titled A Night Slippery with Echoes examines decolonized futures of the Hawaiian kingdom. They are co-founder of the Hale Mahu, which is an LGBTQ space at Pu'upuluhulu University at Mauna Kea, where they welcomed Palestinian allies. Born and raised in Navai Eha, Maui, Kahala has been working with family to reoccupy ancestral lands and has helped build multiple Pu'uhonua, also known as sites of refuge across Maui. After Kahala, our next speaker will be Mahealani Ahia, who is a Los Angeles born Kanaka Maui scholar, activist, song catcher, and story keeper with lineal ties to Lahaina Maui. Mahealani is a PhD candidate in English, specializing in Hawaiian literature, and in women, gender, and sexuality studies, also at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her dissertation is titled Shape Shifting Hawaiian Biography the lives and afterlives of Kihawahine. It theorizes feminist power and leadership within the mo'o, that is the reptilian water deity clan connected to Lahaina. She is also an organizer for students and faculty for justice in Palestine at UH and co-organizer of the Mauna Kea syllabus project. And I'll put the link for that in the chat box momentarily here. Following Mahelani will be Dr. Noor Juda who is an assistant professor in the Department of Asian American Studies at UCLA and a former president and Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow in geography at UC Berkeley. She completed her PhD in geography at UCLA in 2022 and wrote her doctoral thesis mapping, titled Mapping Decolonized Futures, Indigenous Visions for Hawaii and Palestine which focuses on efforts by Palestinian and native Hawaiian communities to imagine and work toward liberated futures while centering indigenous duration as a non-linear temporality. Her work examines mapping practices and indigenous survival and futures in settler states, highlighting how indigenous countermapping is a both cartographic and decolonial praxis. She also has a master's, an MA in Arab studies from Georgetown University and wrote her master's thesis on the role and perception of exile politics within the Palestinian liberation struggle. In particular, among politically active Palestinian youth living in the United States and occupied Palestine. Last, but certainly not least, we will hear from Dr. Rana Berakat, who is an associate professor of history and director of the museum at Berzeit University in Palestine. Her research interests include the history and historiography of colonialism, nationalism, and cultures of resistance. She has published in several venues, including the Journal of Palestine Studies, Jerusalem Quarterly, Settler Colonial Studies, and Native American and Indigenous Studies. She has a book forthcoming with the University of North Carolina Press titled, Lifta and Resisting the Museumification of Palestine, Indigenous History of the Nakba, which advances an indigenous understanding of time, space, and memory in Palestine by focusing on the details of the place and people of Lifta village over time. And her second book is in progress, provisionally titled The Barak Revolt, Constructing a History of Resistance in Palestine. It argues that this 1929 revolt was the first sign in the mandate period of, a, of sustained mass resistance to the settler colonial project including direct and rhetorical actions against both political Zionism and British imperialism, planting seeds of a century of mass political mobilization. So welcome to all of our presenters. And now I turn it over to you, Cynthia Franklin. Thank you, aloha kako. Um, it's great to be here today. As a settler who has lived these past 30 years in Honolulu, I speak to you today from the Ahupua'a of Manoa at a table where I have often sat with each of these panelists, but never, unfortunately, all together. <laughs> I wish we all could be here together in person, but the Zoom room is good too. And I wanna express my gratitude to Sara for calling us together for this teaching and fundraiser. And I also wanna provide a bit of context for why I find this significant. So for the past 10 years, as part of Sabil Hawaii and as co-founder of a group that was initially called Hawaii Coalition for Justice in Palestine, and then the past several years, 
SFJP at UH. I've um, been part of um, groups organizing visits, including for the Decolonial November series that Sara referenced. SFJP at UH has worked on these visits to nurture bonds of solidarity and of friendship from Hawaii to Palestine. And past visitors have included not only Sara, Kehalani, Noor, and Rana, but also Yusuf Aljamal, Hala Alian, Sumeya Awad, Ramti Baroud, Noor Douglas, Angela Davis, Noor Eric Hutt, my son, Rami Kanazi, Tarek Lathan, Nadine Naber, Stephen Salaita, and Nadra Shalhub Kavorkian. And we're preparing to welcome Malak Matar this fall and Sh uh, Shereen uh, Saikali next March. So these visits, which are structured to bring together Hawaiian and Palestinian freedom movements, have taken place not only in UH lecture halls. They've included environmental justice tours, demilitarization tours, visits to Kalo form, farms, and to Mauna Kea. Rana, along with Yusuf Aljamal, both taught courses there for Pu'uhuluhulu University. Visitors have participated in protests, as Sara did, and ceremonies and gatherings where student and community organizers have come together to talk about water as life. Each of these visits has added layers to previous ones, thickening bonds of care and commitment from Hawaii to Palestine. When Sara came here last year, she spoke about love as a method of liberation. She invited Kanaka Maoli and allies to, quote, imagine a new world beyond settler colonialism, exclusionary nationalism, nation states, and the isolation of social movements. This understanding of love as a method of liberation is one that Sara and other visitors have helped to materialize. And this has happened not only during roundtables or other structured events exploring Hawaii and Palestine as interrelated but distinct sites of settlerism. It has also happened over potlucks, during karaoke sessions, while taking ocean swims or hikes, looking at the stars from Mauna Wakea, or just hanging out on Lanai's. What I've learned from these visits is that it is not just once off events, but the spaces between them and the accumulation of these visits over time that foster the conversations and relationships needed to maintain solidarity as a structure. I've been struck by the way solidarity as a structure enables exchanges that take on a life bigger than the individuals who participate in them. When Sara put out the call um, for this teaching and fundraiser, she included not only those of us who spent time together during her visit, um, myself, Mahia, and Aldi Musla, who designed the beautiful graphics for this teaching. She also reached out to those who have come to Hawaii in the years before she did. And this, for me, was a beautiful example of how solidarity gets built over time into a structure made strong by bonds of friendship. Events like today come out of as they strengthen that structure. Um, and to see Palestine for Hawaii take shape in the immediate wake of the Maui wildfires, and also while violence continues to escalate throughout Palestine in ways that continue not to make the news, was very moving. Just as it has been moving to see Kanaka Maoli mobilized yet again in the face of disaster capitalism and the ongoing violence of settlerism to reclaim their aina and take care of one another and all their more than um, human relations. So too, to witness Palestine's solidarity for Hawaii teaches me yet again that love is indeed our method for liberation. Thank you. My name is Kahala Johnson. Um, I want to thank um, Noor Stara, Kehalani, Cynthia Rana, and Mahelani for inviting me here and to be able to speak um, today. Um, I'm a brown skinned Hawaiian Filipino with short black hair, short black hair wearing a black and white uh, kefia given to me by my brother Ali Musla. Um, I'm a protective haleakala who helped to grow Puuhonua or Puuhuluhulu, the refuge camp we raised on Mauna Kea during our fight to stop the 30 meter telescope in 2019. Together with Kiamoku Kapu, Ui Kapu, Loilani Ahia, Kahiki Niles, 
Linda Magallanes, Vicky Coluna Palafox, Consuelo Apolo Gonzalez, and Na Aikane Omawi, we built Pu'uhonua o Kawa in 2020 as a sanctuary to protect our ancestral bones from defilement by millionaire desiccator Peter Martin of West Maui Land Company. And in 2021, my family and I birthed Pu'uhonua o Kuhimana to protect members of our unsheltered community and the sand dunes in our area where we bury our dead from an affordable housing invasion proposed by Debbie Kabibi, the CEO of Maui Economic Opportunity. I share this genealogy of refuge building to remind us that Kanaka are Pu'uhonua builders. Pu'u are raised grounds where the seeds of our survival are planted. Honua is the unflinching earth beneath us, the enduring Papahanao Moku, who at last all disaster. Pu'uhonua are sanctuaries grown in sheltered enclaves, hills, cliffs, shorelines, and mountains, places that are ritually consecrated to protect those within from peril. In the distant past, Kanakamali fleeing the violence of war, invasion, chiefly punishment or famine, could retreat to Pu'uhonua where they could find safety. In Lahaina today, thousands of people seek refuge. The people hunger for the breadfruit of Mala, they thirst for the waters of Kihawahine, and they are growing Pu'uhonua at the burnt edges of US disaster capitalism. The United States is disaster incarnate, a war machine that kills Black, Indigenous, Hawaiian, and Palestinian peoples, the collective catastrophe ruining our lands, rivers, and seas. American occupation and colonization is a war waged against Hawaii and Hawaiians, just as Israeli occupation, colonization, and Zionist apartheid wage war against Palestine and Palestinians. The settler states is the shared crisis we face as Kanaka Maoli and Kanaka Palestina, who fight every day for the survival and liberation of our land and people. The fires of Lahaina have burned away the postcard image of Hawaii as a paradise for US settlers and soldiers. And in its place stands the people calling for the return of the land. Anything short of land back for Lahaina is a settler settlement. Land back is not FEMA funding. Land back is not Red Cross charity. Land back is not affordable housing that houseless Hawaiians will never be able to afford. Land back is decolonization. Land back is deoccupation. Land back is returning Lahaina to Kanaka and Kanaka to Lahaina on our terms. Land back is a promise to never settle for what the settler offers when you can take it from them instead. We are taking the land back. We are growing sanctuaries at Lahaina in the ashes of the occupier. Lahaina is a puhonua, and a puhonua is sovereignty now. Hawaiians like Te Aumoku Kapu and Ui Kapu, Maiohana, are sanctuaries, and the return to ancestral lands in Kawaula, Lahaina, years ago, was a watershed moment for Maui. The Kapu family does not wait for sovereignty or liberation to arrive. They have been building puhonua against the disaster of U.S. colonization and occupation for decades. With the support of lawyer comrades Richard McCarty, Lance Collins, and Bianca Asaki, Kiyomoku has fought and won against Pioneer, Pioneer Mill Plantation and West Maui Land Company, who stole water and land to grow sugarcane and gated communities in Lahaina. Pioneer Mill was founded by James Campbell, who helped to overthrow Queen Liliuokalani of the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1893. And so this battle for land back and water back in Lahaina is a struggle in the courts and in the streets to obtain justice for Kanaka Maoli for over 250 years of oppression. In the early 2010s, Kiamoku and his family established Naakane o Maui in a building that was used as a soup kitchen for the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, or ILWU, when they struck against Pioneer Mill. Located at the sacred site of Moku'ula, Naakane has served as a political, spiritual, educational, archival, strategic, and martial center for the defense and edification of Hawaiians in Lahaina and Maui. When wildfires destroyed Lahaina homes in 2018, 2020, and 2021, Naikane mobilized the community to provide shelter and mutual aid for survivors of this disaster. I myself remember seeing members of Naikane on the front lines of the fires carrying buckets of water to slow the spread of the flames 
placing their lives at great risk to protect the people. This is Pu'u Honua. A month ago, Naikani Culture Center was destroyed by wildfires and we grieve this loss as we grieve for our dead, our missing, and all those traumatized at this time. We are grateful for the support that can be given today as an act of solidarity between Palestine and Hawaii. Despite the loss of Naikane, we know that a Puhonua is not a structure or a building. Puhonua is a people. Puhonua is a place, a place where we are liberated by our love for each other. A Puhonua is aloha, and aloha is the union of intimacy and intifada. The Maui medics healers hui embody the practice of aloha as intimate uprising. Founded in 2015 by Noilani Ahia to protect the protectors of our sacred mountain Haleakala on Maui, the medics were called by Dr. Kalamani Heo in 2019 to create the Mauna Medics, a direct action frontline medical team which has supported the protectors of Mauna Kea on Hawaii Island at Puhonua o Puhuluhulu. As sister organizations, Maui Medics and Mauna Medics were the first Kanaka Maoli grassroots organization to provide a decolonial healing response to the physical, psychological, spiritual, and medical needs of those hurt and displaced by the fires. Born in the struggle for Hawaiian liberation, Maui Medics provides a sanctuary of aloha beyond the medical industrial and psycho psychological industrial complex, a refuge which centers Kanaka Maoli and other marginalized people in their practice of primary care as resistance. Maui medics and Mauna medics are Puhonua doulas um, who are performing the difficult work of birthing the future of Aloha we desperately need now. For Puhonua are our future, the future we flee to as we escape the abuse and abandonment of the settler state. While the fires of US imperialism continue to bombard and burn us, in the ruins of empire lies the promise of refuge. In the ruins of empire, we build sanctuary. When they scatter us like seeds, we grow sanctuary. Where we wander homeless and houseless, we, we find sanctuary. My loko, my waho, we seek for sanctuary. And sheltered in the we of our gathering now, we are sanctuary. E na ki mai ko mai e na na i mai ka hale o ka ko mai luna alalo mai ka hiki a ka hiki mai ka hiki na a ko mohana mai yuka a ka mai loko a waho. Ki ia i ia, ma alama ia, e pale aku i na ho u pili kana i ko ka ko no hona. Ah, mama, Mahalo e kahala. Aloha mai kako o mahi alani ahia ko uinoa. Uh, haole au me ka mahalo ike ela. Hi, my name is Mahea and I'm really grateful and happy to be with here with you today. Um, as a diasporic Kanako Weavey or a person of the bones, I was born in Los Angeles on the Tongva lands and raised near the seaside of the Ahashiman lands in Orange County. About 15 years ago, I had a recurring dream in which I could chant and speak in Hawaiian. Um, and since I could do neither at the time, I took it as a ho'elona or a sign that I needed to move home to my Hawaiian father's homeland of Maui to learn. So as a lineal descendant of Lahaina Maui, um, and I can trace my genealogy so far back to 22 generations to Pi'ilani, I remember feeling that it was the very first place that my feet ever felt truly at home. My feet felt grounded where I actually belonged. Um, and so today I'm gonna be sharing some stories of return because the restoration of Maui land will require a return of our waters. And a restoring of our colonial history means remembering and reviving our sacred symbols and a resurgence of our practices. But most of all, it means a restored decision-making power and agency by the rightful kia'i, the protectors, the kanaka who hold the deepest genealogical and geographical connections to the aina, to the land. Aina is our term for those, or aloha aina is our term for those who love the land. Uh, but it's so much more than that. It, we're intimately connected with our aina. We too live and die for and with our lands and waters. They're as much ancestral kin to us as our human family is. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to weave several stories together, including my sister Noilani's story, as she's integral to the restoration efforts on the ground right now on Maui, um, as the co-founder of Mauna Medic Healers, who we as Kahala just mentioned. 
so about the same time as I was having these profound series of dreams, Noilani was finishing acupuncture school in New York and was hanaid or spiritually adopted in the ceremony by a Native, uh, Native American woman. And while she was in the sweat lodge, our kupuna or ancestors came to her with a vision and a message and said, you need to go home and be with our people. So she opened the way by moving to Maui and opened up a community acupuncture clinic, which served our community at very low cost, um, sometimes free care for our um, Kanaka and Kupuna. Um, and she also opened up a different space um, for us to look at different healing practices, both ancestral and contemporary. And I soon followed her to Maui. Um, and living in Lahaina together, we rebuilt the pilina or the relations to our aina. So pilina is that foundational word. Pili is to stick, to cling. Pilina means to bind us in reciprocal relations. And that comes with kuleana, that comes with a responsibility and a great privilege to serve each other. So Noilani and I worked and lived and frequented the wharf I, um, area of Lahaina. Our Uncle Sam and cousins Conrad and Howard played music in the clubs and restaurants with our brother Derek. Our cousins Sina and Angelique had a hair salon. Um, other cousins uh, taught school in the area. We had so many different relations built up that were so integral to the places they were um, just that you couldn't disentangle them with the people that were connected to that. And I'm so grateful for the memories and stories I carry. For now, they're all I have left, and I really still can't wrap my head around it that it's just gone. Um, the area that was destroyed in the fires on August 8th is today called La Haina. Um, La being the bright heat of the sun, it invokes heat, and the leeward or drier side of the island. I've also heard it called a Laha Aina or a land of prophecy, but it's most fondly referred to by Kanaka as Malu Ulu Olele, which recalls the Malu, the peaceful shade of the groves of Ulu, breadfruit trees that filled the landscape for miles. It was known for its abundance of vai or fresh water, which rained upon Mauna Kahalavai Mountains. And in fact, at the peak of Pu'ukukui, one of the wettest spots on the earth receives like 386 inches of year. So when we think of the hot, dry Lahaina that you see in postcards now, that's nothing like what our kupuna knew. It was lush. Our lands um, for a visual picture were divided into what we call ahupua'a, which are according to the natural landscape and followed main waterways. Um, so you can imagine a slice of pie from the mountain peak down to the ocean. And every part of that region was cultivated from upland forest trees for building canoes and houses, down extensive lo'ikalo, which are um, terraces of kalo, uh, the taro fruit, uh, which was our staple. And I also wanted to, at this point, Mahalo Ali, who designed our flyer pairing our kala leaf, uh, our staple food with your handa leaf, which is known to be stubborn and rugged and you know persevering despite everything. Um, and so as we made our way down with the waters, we would hit the seaside to these mass local ia, which are fish ponds. Um, and archaeologists estimate now that the main one in Lahaina, Moku'ula, which you've heard of now a couple of times, it was at least 17 miles wide. So we're talking about tons and tons of fresh water flowing from the mountain to the sea. And if you drive there today, that's not what we see. Colonialism has robbed us of our water. So why am I talking and taking so much time telling you about our vai, our water? Because ola ikavai, water is life. It's our most precious source and resource. And in fact, the Hawaiian word for wealth is vai vai, vai reduplicated. The symbol for vai and the protectors of vai, uh, the kia'i, are called mo'o. Akua mo'o are reptilian water deities and they can take the forms of giant lizards. Um, they also take the form of the o'opu or gobi fish that kind of swim upstream up the currents and up the steepest waterfalls by these pico they have on their, their bellies that connect them to the, the earth as they climb. And these are all symbols of our strength and resilience and attunement to the water cycle. Um, these fish also live in the kalo patches, in the lo'i kalo, um, and they build a reciprocal relationship. So here we have an entire um, natural economy, a natural reciprocal bond with our aina and with each other. Um, one of the most famous uh, uh, akua mo'o is kihawahine, and um, 
I've been very fortunate to be able to study her. She's an ancestress to me. Um, during the 16th century in the Pi'ilani era of Maui, of Lahaina, um, she was a chief. And um, upon her death, she was deified and turned into a mo'o through a kaku'ai ceremony. And so we believe that she still watches over us in the land. You can see her moving. So when the Kanaka say we call for a restoration of muku'ula, we're calling back for that mana. Kihawahine was a leader to us. She uh, was called upon in times of Kamehameha uh, when he united the islands together. She has been called upon time and again over the, the generations in order to bring Kanaka together um, and rise up as one to protect the waters and to protect the aina. The mo'o, when we think of the lizard spine, is also a symbol of genealogy and cultural persistence of our ancestral bones. Each of those vertebrae are a generation. And we're talking about restoring this genealogy, the story of our connection to Aina. And so just like the mo'o who can shed its skin or who in colonial times had its tail severed, it can still regrow back. So it's one of our deepest symbols for regeneration. And that's really important to me and my sister as diasporic Kanaka who have been moku, have been severed and displaced onto the American continent. But somehow through our dreams and our visions and our sacred spaces that have been held by other indigenous people. And this is really important. We find homes in each other. We make pu'uhonua in other indigenous folks. We have the space and safety in order to hear our own kupuna call us home. And so we have been called home to Moku'ula to help restore the waters. And so my sister is on the ground today as we speak. Aloha e no, no, no e lani. Um, I love you, my tita. Um, and I thank you for taking this journey with us. I leave you with another story um, about pico. So pico are our umbilical connections. Uh, we have three pico, one in our head that connects us to the ancestors, one in our belly, which connects us to the contemporary generation, and one in our ma'i or genitals, which connects us to the future generations. And we think of this long continuity. Um, there is a story of a mo'o that lives above Moku'ula called uh, Mauna Kahavahine, and she is a great um, female mo'o, and from her, it is said, jumped a tiny baby called mo'o ahia, which is, which is really important to me because that's our last name. Uh, we, we are descended from this mo'o ahia who is said to, with its umbilical cord still connected, jumped and leaped all the way down to through Tahiti and down into Rapa Nui. So it connects us throughout the Pacific, but somehow it was called back by its mama and it found its way bounded back into the, the landscape. And you can now see the baby kind of hiding and peeking its head out, looking over Moku'ula. And so we also call out the names of Mauna Kavahine and Mo'oahia to restore our mana to that space. It is a pico to us and pico are the center. There are our world center, the, the peaks of mountains, um, everything that is centering those most harmed. We apply these kinds of principles of pico in our collective care work. Unfortunately, um, I see our stories have been um, colonized in the land itself. So when other folks say they want to restore Lahaina, they're talking about restoring the banyan tree, which the banyan tree was a beautiful tree that is actually not a Kanaka tree. It was um, planted originally in the 1800s by one of the missionaries and um, and it has become a symbol for those visiting um, to sit under the malu of that. Um, but Kanaka ourselves are, have a funny meme going around on social media saying not malu, uh, not malu of the um, the the tree, but malu ulu olele. So we need to restore our own our own symbols, not those of the colonizers. When folks think of, of restoring Lahaina, they think of the sugarcane train. They think of the great sugarcane that they can eat. They think of pineapple plantations. They think of missionary house tours and, and touring that part of Lahaina. But that's not what we wanna restore. We want to go back in our genealogy and restore the waters that have fed us 
that have fed us for generations. And so in order to do that, we need to decolonize our imaginations. For so long, this rhetoric of inevitability of the march of progress across our lands and bodies, we're told that we need tourism. And yet tourism actually, if you look at the numbers, is not the number one um, source of income to our islands, it's actually military. So they do tell us we need the military, and yet the military is constantly poisoning us. Um, there are leaks of the telescope on top of our sacred mountain, Haleakala. We know on Oahu that you know the, the tankers from Red Hill are leaking. Um, we're told that we need police, and unfortunately, they they put our own Kanaka on the front line to stand against us when we're protecting our own lands. When those um, Kupuna and Wahine stood in Lahaina to protect the Ivi that we are being desecrated, they sent our own Kanaka police to stand against us. So they do this on purpose. Um, we're told that there aren't enough funds to build hospitals on the west side, and yet at the same time, they're currently in the permitting process to build an entirely new town in um, in Honolulu and in Oluwalu, which are just north and south of Lahaina. So they don't have money for, for care, but they have money for more um, industry to bring in other folks for quote unquote affordable housing. Unfortunately, all of these stories of a return of Lahaina do not rest with us. And so as Kahala mentioned, we had a vision of what could be. And I turn now to the time when we were on Mauna Kea. And I remember sitting outside and Rana telling a story, a beautiful story about hope and reminding us not to always center the colonizer stories, but to really envision our own stories. And I remember sitting in the poetry workshop with Sara and dreaming with Ali about what we could build. And I was able to to write another poem in your course and another letter. And so all of these movements of solidarity um, help us dream bigger. I remember being on the Mauna with uh, Noor and she was telling us about in geography how they were designing landscapes where there would be a place for those who would want to return from the diaspora to stay for extended periods of time. So now when Kahala and I envision our own pu'uhonua for our ohana, we, we tell each other, make sure we have a space dedicated to those who want to return, because maybe they can't return now for a long time, but they can come for a while. They can experience it. They can reconnect with our aina. During COVID on Maui, we saw mutual aid as a main source. And um, we noticed that there were less cars. That meant more coral growing. We noticed that there was less sunscreen in the water, which meant more sea life came back. So we know after Mauna Kea and the Pu'uhonua what is possible, and we will no longer settle for anything less than that. Um, and so I want to leave us with just a few images of your olive, tree, your olive tree and our ulu tree, our kala leaf and your anaf leaf. And I know that these are only symbols. And as Tuck and Yang tell us, decolonization is not a metaphor. And yet still our stories are what we carry in our body. They are what we share with each other. And that's what nourishes us as much as our food does to help us grow in solidarity and keep each other alive. This idea of life and regeneration and rebirth is uh, one of the reasons I call to support the Pacific Birth Collective because they're serving the most vulnerable of us. They're serving the wahine and the keiki, the women and the children who are our next generations. And it's so essential that they get this kind of care, especially in a time of turmoil, because we're still here. Our bones are still in the sand. Our births and our deaths will keep us connected to this aina. And so I think again of our visions and our dreams and our pico and how my sister and I have been called home and how we think of rights of return of the Palestinians to your home and our right of diasporic to come home because why should those who own condos and houses from afar who it's their third or fourth house be allowed to rebuild when our own diasporic Kanaka do not yet have a place to come to? So I leave us with these, these images in a chant that Kahala and I worked on together. And it uh, we shared, I shared some of it in a presentation to American Studies Association, uh, the, a piece that I co-wrote with uh, my very dear mentor and friend, Cindy Franklin. Um, and it is about 
Palestine or Palestina and solidarity with Hawaii. And it talks about the ulu and the, the oliva tree. It talks about what was up will come down as in some of our prophecy chants. It talks about the hawaku, the, the crescent moon, and it refers to Hina, our own moon, which is considered the mother of Maui. So I leave you with this oli. Pale hina nakia i kui na pua, kaulo kaoli va i ka aino gaza. E ho luna e pio lalo e hoaka na hoku e hina na paya. Pale hina nakia i kui na pua, kaulo kaoli va i ka aino ramala. E ho luna e pio lalo e hoaka no hoku e hina na paya. Pali na na ki ai kui na pua ka ula ko li va i ka ai no Palestina. E i ho na e pi o la lo e ho a ka na ho ku e hina na paya. Ua lo he mai ma ko i ke ka he mai ha va i ne. E pani mai o ko i ko le o lo no e no ke o la e ke a e. Mahalo no. Well, I have no idea how any of us are supposed to follow that. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Maya. Uh, thanks to everyone who's spoken already and Serena will speak in a minute and to Sada for getting us together. And as everyone said, Ali for his design and Nura for her work as well. Um, I think after such wonderful talks, it's, it's hard to know what to share. Um, and certainly Keolani and Mahaya and Kahala have given us so much to think about, particularly in regards to the specifics of, of Maui and Hawaiian history. And I hope that it's been as informative and enriching for everyone that's joining us today on the call and, and may watch the recording um, as it has been for me. I've said before, I think, um, you know, in other spaces that my choice to include Hawaii in my research uh, I wish I could say it was the result of some epiphany moment or great story, but I had a just general insistence of highlighting U.S. settler colonialism um, in a comparative project. And I, you know, this truly bizarre kind of personal confusion in the realization that there was ever an apology um, when we all know America doesn't apologize for anything. And so, you know, I thought I have to look into this. And from there, academically, I went into a bit of a black hole. Uh, of reading history and led down its own path of me thinking I could ask some of the same questions about mapping and futures and Hawaii that I was asking about Palestine and, and about Algeria. But it was really in the experience of being in Hawaii um, that was truly transformative, not just in an analytical approach, but in a personally political one. I don't think I've said this before, or maybe the more, the more honest term is admitted this before. Um, but my time with Kanaka Maui in Hawaii is the first time I think I ever really viscerally felt outside of the Arab world, solidarity from others for Palestine. It's not that I hadn't spent a, a lifetime witnessing and attending events across the US or Europe that were incredibly pro-Palestinian and done with love and good intention, but for all of our attempts to characterize terms like radical love and reciprocity, I realized that for me, the loudest form of solidarity was silence. Um, and I know that sounds crazy to some of us because we spend so much of our lives individually and collectively trying to raise voices, our voices, the voices of others. But the silence I'm talking about here is the one that we have in the presence of each other. Um, the silence between us, between Palestinians, Palestinians and Arabs and native communities, Black Americans, colonized, formerly colonized populations around the world. And it is a silence in very specific, almost impossible to name moments uh, that signals to me when I'm in a space or in the presence of people who understand. And when I arrived in Hawaii, right, or started reading or going to events to learn more, I was in a whirlwind of familiar terms, occupation, annexation, dispossession, settlement, homeland, diaspora, exile, um, but in a completely unfamiliar context, right, of the Pacific. And I had, you know, some vague previous references of, of history that I understood, but nothing, admittedly, that compared to the knowledge I had of the Middle East. And I still have so much to learn. 
But what became clear was that there was no race to get there, to know it, to a level of information or detail that was required of me or of those I was around for that matter. The need for, for volume, and by volume, I mean not heft, but loudness, right? Seemed uh, to dissipate because the starting line of said race had moved all, all together. You talk and you vent, yes, and ask each other questions and debate details and paths forward. It's not the conversation that vanishes. Um, but all the talking is not out of a need to prove something. It's to be with one another and in a quiet that you don't have to explain. Um, I'll tell a quick kind of funny story. When my parents came to visit me in Hawaii, our friend Kyle from, from Detours uh, took them around one day. And we stopped at a beach in Waimanolo and my dad smiled and took a deep breath <laughs> and said it reminded him of Deir el-Balah in Gaza, it's a, a beach in Gaza. Guys, my mom and I, we lost it. We laughed so hard at my dad that we almost fell over laughing. There is nothing about where we were that resembles anywhere on a coast in Gaza or any other Mediterranean coast for that matter. There was no resemblance visually, right? Um, and my dad and Kyle looked at us and asked, why are you laughing? And so my mom and I had to very sort of innocently explain to Kyle that, that comparing with where we were standing to Gaza seemed comical to us. Um, my dad was not amused <laughs> by our mocking amusement. And he tried to correct very quickly by saying it was the color and the feel of the sand, not the overall view, right? But by then my mom and I had had our laugh and we knew what was happening and we, we smiled at my dad. But Kyle looked at my dad who he'd met only a few hours earlier, put his hand on his shoulder, helped him take off his shoes so he could walk around barefoot for a little while. And dad thanked him. And in return, surprisingly, was the quietest he'd been all day. Um, and for some of the people on this call who have met my father, you know that that's a difficult feat for him. There was no lecture on British history in Palestine or comparison of plant life to the Mediterranean or prodding questions to Kyle that had been happening all day. He took his walk on the coast, on the beach, and he went home with a smile on his face. After the initial moment where my mom and I chuckled, what I was really smiling at for the rest of the time that we were standing on that, on that beach was my father having one of a dozen moments that I had had a cup for the last couple of months in Hawaii. Quiet moments. And he had quite a few that day, so did my mom. Often accompanied by a smirk and mm -hmm, or a disapproving shake of the head at a historical story. For all their conversations and questions, there was a lot of silence. And it's a silence that's hard to describe, but it's one that we all recognize when we see it. My parents called me when they saw the news on Maui. Dad said the scenes looked worse than Gaza, and I agreed. I told them a little bit about the local efforts to organize and rebuild, and we both commented on how wonderful it is that folks on the other islands can reach each other. What a blessing it is that they can be there. I was reminded of an effort in 2014, one that I'm still amazed Palestinians pulled off actually, where folks in the West Bank organized truckfuls of aid to Gaza that actually made it across the border. It wasn't and isn't unusual for the community to show up for each other, but it was a rare occurrence of the occupation not crushing the attempt. As Keolani and Mahaya and Kahala laid out for us, what happened and is happening in Mali now is about more than a heartbreaking natural disaster. It is a direct result of ongoing colonization, dispossession, and occupation. And as Kahala insightfully named it, it's the first time I'd, I'd heard someone say it this way, collective catastrophe. It's one part of a global Nakba. As I've watched so much local work go into recovery of Maui, I want to encourage folks today to also understand that any do donations that they give are a loud, silent way to support not just a community in a moment of crisis, but one in common and joint struggle. Living through a moment of sumud, steadfastness, as we say, in a long history of surviving and rebuilding. We are communities, both, both communities and many others for that matter, that feel our pasts, presence, and future all at once. And while at times that can feel debilitating, 
in other moments that is empowering and reminds us that our connections with each other and those around the world who understand us, who we can comfortably sit in silence with, all, that, that silence is stronger than all of the noise. So on that note, I will pass it to the wonderful Rana Barakat to finish us out for the day. Thank you, Noor. Um, that was beautiful. And I want to attest to what you just said, Noor. I, um, I am speechless and I'm not often speechless. So this is, um, this is pretty huge. Um, I want to begin my brief intervention with gratitude. I'm honored to be a voice among many radical comrades in conversation here, hosted in the space of Jadalia. And I'm humbled to be coming together in tragedy and in solidarity as the fires on Maui continue to impact the lives of so many Kanaka Maui. I'm proud to say that I've shared space and stories with these wonderful humans before, some in Palestine and all in Hawaii, including two other names that others have mentioned who were part of the planning of this, Ali Muslih and Noor Arakat. As Cindy mentioned, I had the honor of visiting Hawaii in 2019, an, exper in, an experience that was generously organized by her and, had, and I had the astounding joy of sharing space with every voice on this panel tonight, space and story. I wanna remind everyone here of the resource page, um, which is put into the link of the docs and it's gonna be up on the Jadalia site. It was put together by folks here as well as our collective support for mutual aid. We're coming here to support mutual care. I am and will remain in a state of speechlessness when Mahaya just described how she herself cannot believe that it is now gone. There's nothing to say after that. I do not know how to speak after that other than to help us all come together and feel in the most intimate spaces and places of ourselves that we, that we have inherited from those that came before us, our ancestors. We remain to restore and to my sweet friends return. I must confess, confess that I've long struggled with the concept of solidarity, but I wanna share this evening. It's really late here, so it is late evening. I'm coming to you from Ramallah in Palestine. I feel this space, this space of being together as a gathering, as the Malbshara describes it. And tonight, to borrow from what Cindy mentioned earlier, we have done these gatherings over time. And over time, we've created in these gatherings layers. And I think perhaps Cindy has helped me understand that solidarity is built as a structure. I understand in our ongoing relationship of shared stories that I want to listen. I need to listen. We need to listen. Listening is how we mobilize. And as Noor just beautifully described, listening also is part of the powerful silence. Our lives are shared and our futures are shared. As mentioned in the announcement to this event, Kanaka Maui have taught us that these wildfires in Maui are not natural, but they are settler colonial disasters with roots in the exportation of land, native lands, waters, and other natu natural resources. Palestinians and native Hawaiians have quite different histories, but we do share a great deal, as well as including the violence of settler colonialism. As Stephen Salaita says, we contest the same colonial apparatus. This huge historical apparatus functions differently in different geographies, but it is a real and material monster that is driven by the fuel of our elimination. But as Kahala so profoundly shared with us tonight, we also share something else, a genealogy of resistance. We share resistance and together we settle for nothing short of land back and return. Palestine is both a site for settler colonial violence and military occupation. Aspects of European capital's control and the violent imposition of European imagination onto Palestine through what I suppose can be described as the Holy Land predated settler violence. In the late 19th century, European settlers driven by the ideology of Zionism began claiming land in Palestine. This was later codified in the British mandate after their armies military op militarily occupied the Levant. By late 1947 and the start of the Nakba War, Zionist military and paramilitary forces began consistently attacking and forcing Palestinians out of their homes and our homeland. In that, in that war, we were meant to lose a homeland. More than 500 villages, towns, and cities were destroyed, and nearly three quarters of a million Palestinians were forcibly driven from their homes. It did not end though, for the Nakba is ongoing, as is the violence of settler colonialism. 
as the late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish described. He described the Nakba as, quote, an extended presence, present that promises to continue into the future, the ongoing Nakba. The fires burned in, in Maui come from unadulterated greed and power. It seemed like an indescribable tragedy, but we all know too well that it, it was not, not a natural tragedy, certainly not a natural disaster. This is made by men, made by greed, made by power, and made by and through dispossession. Those of us who endure the violence of imperialism know all too well how water has not only been turned into a commodity, but a rare one. Water is life and is, and is so clear to everyone, stealing water is stealing life. Through a vicious timeline of colonial capitalism, we were being de deprived of the very means of life. As I was preparing for today, I took a break and I walked down my block to buy enough of that commodity, water, to get me through the end of the week. According to a joint press release in the March of 2023 from the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics and the Palestinian Water Authority, the Israeli state controls over 85% of Palestinian water in the occupied territories. Control means that they, we don't see much of it. I anticipated the sounds on the roof of our buildings this evening. The water should be coming soon. The same sound my young mother was taught to anticipate in Jerusalem. I find my ears becoming accustomed to this sound in Ramallah, but I heard other sounds that I'd also share with those that came before me. I heard children playing a game. I heard the sounds of winds coming forth to cool off a hot summer night. And I heard the sounds of resistance because resistance is ongoing. As Kahala so eloquently stated, Aloha Aina is intifada. Land back is water back. And as Mahaya described, we return to where our feet belong. Thank you. Thank you all for your outstanding, beautiful, powerful and compelling presentations. Wow. Okay, so um, we would like to uh, have some time, 20 minutes for question and answer. We understand that people need to log off. Uh, this is being recorded and can be retrieved subsequently through the Jadalia YouTube channel uh, where it's being live streamed right now. And if you could type your question into the group chat, that would be great. If you're not in a position to um, type it and can somehow signal to me or uh, one of our other presenters, uh, I can help facilitate that part of it as well. might take people just a minute or two to catch their breath after all of that. Really, there's so much there. I do have a question. I don't wanna preempt anybody from the audience though. I can put this out um, and if somebody else chimes in, we can kind of keep this one looming uh, in the mix. Mahalani, you mentioned explicitly mutual aid. And one of the things that I think about when I think about decolonization, which I heard in all of these presentations, and also um, Kahala, you really underscored that using that term. I think about alternatives to state formation, right? Alternatives to any kind of state entity or trying to recapture or reassert uh, statehood. And so I wanted to know if. Any of you might want to speak to this, this really difficult moment. I mean, the devastation, the scale of it has yet to be really fully accounted for. Um, the fires themselves were just contained a few days ago. They've been ongoing for almost an entire month. Um, but I did want to kind of open up space to talk about the ways in which Kanaka Mali in particular on the ground and indeed on other islands who have found ways to get supplies to family to Ohana and other community members, supplies in the wake of abdication and straight up abandonment by city, county and state officials. And then we just saw sort of the, the pittance offered by FEMA, the federal agency to boot. 
around alternatives to any kind of governmental um, you know, solution here in thinking about decolonization and a Kanaka Maui centered restoration of Lahaina and Maui and indeed Kapai Aina o Hawaii in thinking about um, anti statist and anti capitalist um, modes of rebuilding for a future that I think necessarily have to be part of what we might call or anyone calls decolonization. Well, I can give a few examples. Um, so we have a history of mobilizing um, that has a, a long genealogy, but in my own memory, I can think of um, some of our kupuna in the community, like Auntie Nani Rogers, Punani Rogers, talking about during Iniki, um, the, the hurricanes of Iniki in the, um, the late 90s, no help came. There was no water, no electricity, no sewage for months. And I remember her telling me, and she said, you know, baby, you don't have to worry because this is how we know that we can come together and we'll take care of each other. It was always us who took care of us. And so when we had the experience on Mauna Kea, we also saw it was always us who takes care of each other. We built a strong enough infrastructure with uh, Mauna Medics that, um, when the, the fires came out, there was, there's a funny meme going around that says, there was a Kanaka Costco on every corner before FEMA even arrived. And that was really true because um, Kahala and I were on those signals. Immediately the, the Kahea, the call went out and every single island found drop spots. And when the cars couldn't get through because they were being prevented by the National Guard and the police force, um, our local fishermen took their boats and they drove and picked up things on one island and dropped them off in Kahana on the other on Maui. So our 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 um, our hunters on Molokai went and collected a whole bunch of deer and brought over meat. So everyone basically whatever they had to give, they collected and we found all kinds of spaces to bring it together. And we we have so um, the farm the farmers the local farmers who used to um, have lots of food going to the hotels now have an abund an extra abundance of food that they can't sell right because the hotels are a lot of them are closed down so they put out calls and everyone was encouraged to go buy your food they made um, CSA boxes to deliver to different sites so um, we really do have an infrastructure built up that we can rely on what we need is the larger powers that be to listen to us and to let us organize and give us the resources to do it. So I have a funny story. Um, I think the first weekend um, I was in one of the tents helping my sister and they created about six or seven little hubs just outside the, um, the blackout zone where the National Guard was keeping it, um, keeping everyone out. And in my hub at one point, um, one of the Red Cross came up to me and started asking for um, some medicines and supplies. And I and one of the nurses turned around and looked at him and said, aren't you the resource folks? You know, aren't you supposed to have everything? And yet here they were coming to us and we're like, we're Kanaka who collected our own medicines and supplies for each other. And now you want to take ours and give it under the guise of Red Cross. That's just one of the many, many stories of um, sort of a bloopers reel of the ridiculousness of the state sanctioned aid that's supposedly coming to us. It's always been and it always will be us that take care of each other. Yeah, those are those are excellent. Um, I remember when that happened with the Red Cross, we were all pretty shocked. <laughs> um, I guess to respond to the question about mutual aid, um, I think right now we're witnessing a, a moment and by moment, I mean like, a decade of Kanaka learning how to be Lahui again. Lahui means um, nation, but it also is a reference, anything that kind of clusters together. So like when plants, um, like breadfruit, when breadfruit clusters together, that's a Lahu. Um, we're learning to be Lahui again, to be Kanaka again, um, together as one. But we're also learning to be Kaya Ulu. Kaya Ulu um, means those who grow, that root word ulu um, is the breadfruit. Um, and it's the word for growth and for, um, particularly for Lahaina, it is one of their, their signifiers of being from Lahaina. As Mahaya mentioned, malulu olele, yeah? the breadfruit trees of, breadfruit, breadfruit groves of Lahaina. 
And I think that's where our mutual aid um, really comes from, these ancestral trees um, planted by our chiefs and people from um, not, too, not too long ago uh, when the water was still there. Um, I think we're, we're regrowing that. Um, the working class labor unions, particularly the women um, and mahus on the ground who have been organizing like from day one, um, just this immediate response on signal um, on our, our communication. Um, and much of this has been, again, in the decade um, leading up to this with Mauna Kea, Haleakala, um, and other movements for Puuhonua building in Lahaina. Um, that, set, that has set these um, structures, um, Kanaka structures, um, that are not just in opposition to settler structures or the occupier structures, but actually exceed it because it digs deep down into the soil of our past and stretches out like a tree into our future and creates shade for us now. Um, it is wonderful to be part of that. It is wonder to wonderful to remember that aid, that kokua um, today. And um, I imagine that the settler state is terrified by our aloha. They are terrified because they're realizing we don't need them. We need each other. I think we should terrorize them as, with our aloha as much as possible. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Any other responses to the anarchist question? I mean, I kind of like ending with we should terrorize them with our aloha. It seems like the best way to end. <laughs> that, it works across geographies too. <laughs> so it's good, I like it. I mean, I think so much of what of what we're seeing and what has been described um, in Maui now, we've seen also, right? We not this is not the first time we see it in Hawaii, but it's also not something that's new to to the Palestinian context either. We've seen it for sixteen plus years with the, with the siege in, in Gaza, fifty plus years of occupation, seventy plus years, et cetera, since its possession in the refugee camps across the Arab world, um, through diaspora, through exile, is similar to, to Hawaii, like whether Kanaka are on the islands or whether they're in California or the connection there is so strong and that mutual aid has managed to transverse boundaries that have been set by our colonizers for, for decades. Um, and we continue to find ways to be there for each other, uh, which I think is, is incredible and just goes to show that you know, it ain't over till it's over. Here, here. If I could just add one thing, I think what we need to be constantly aware of in the kind of historical trajectory that uh, Noor just described is that from the 19, from 1929, I would argue in Palestine, but certainly from the 1930s, the settler state recognized or started to learn what was they were afraid of. Um, and they worked deliberately and they have over three generations working deliberately to understand that our, what our organizations sort of look like and attack those structures. So those are the kind of things. So it is a, it is a question about mobilization, Kaolani, and about how coming together in that horizontal structure is important. But it's also, I think we need to constantly be aware of that um, that is also something to nurture and, and protect um, because it will and is being attacked. Um, so we just, we need to be aware of what, what you just described as their, their fear, um, and out of their fear comes their rage and their violence. So we need to be very aware of that, I think. Thank you. That's so important. Any other um, questions? We can end on that note. Uh, we don't, um, unless anybody from the audience wants to put a question in the chat box, I think this question of um, nurturing and protecting uh, yeah. is super important and gives it a lot of food for thought. Okay. Thank you again, everyone who presented your outstanding um, contributions to this teach-in and to those of you who attended 
and to Sarah and all of the organizers. And hopefully um, people can pass those links along in terms of the fundraising piece. Um, if you can spread the word, these are um, entities that we talked about as a group that we wanna uplift. And um, thank you again so much for attending. And uh, whew. here's to the future of Maui and to our respective struggles for decolonization and restoration and regeneration. Mahalo nui loa. Aloha kako. Abuho. Thank you all so much. So much love for you all. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Mahalo, Nui.